Okay, well, uh, welcome everybody um, to this LPLS talk. My name is Eric Blair. I'm president of the Leeds Phil and Lit, and uh, it's a very great pleasure to welcome you tonight. And uh, this is a fantastic topic. It was actually uh, when I um, uh, became, came into the president's role um, uh, about a year and a half ago, it was what one of the topics that I really uh, you know, what, what wanted us to cover, and it's a great, great pleasure to see that we're going to do that tonight. So thank you very much, Nessa, for uh, uh, agreeing to talk to us about artificial intelligence. And I'm just going to hand over to Rachel, who's going to uh, introduce you. Rachel. Thanks, Eric. So Nessa Cohen had a broad-based first degree at Columbia University in New York, and then did her postgraduate studies in Israel where she went into the field of biological physics. So she's um, in this very interdisciplinary field of work, investigating and defining physical processes that underlie the functioning of living systems from the level of molecules right up through to organisms. And I hope she's going to help us to grasp the essence of how this background in pinning down fundamental principles can help devise artificial systems that can undertake tasks that couldn't be done by the conventional machines or by humans or other natural organisms. So um, and next time we're going to have Gabriella to take us through the ethics of artificial intelligence, some of the issues beyond the practical elements of how it works into the realms of the relationship between AI and human inventors and those whose lives are affected by its deployment. So now we're going to have this intelligent introduction by Professor Netta Cohn of the University of Leeds. Over to you, Netta. Thank you. Hi, thanks everybody. And thanks Eric and, and, um, and Rachel for inviting me for this. And it's, it's a real pleasure. Um, I have to say that, that um, AI is one of those topics that um, you, you get two people in the room and you get three opinions about every aspect of it. So this is quite a um, tall order here, but um, I don't um, pretend to give you textbook answers or reliable answers or defensible answers. I will just give you my view of things, which is, which is obviously um, very biased by my own history. Uh, which, which uh, is not even in computer science. So, so I've been in a computer science department for 19 years now, but before that I, I had no background in computer science whatsoever. So, um, so what brought me into computer science was the study of biological systems. Biological systems um, have functions. Um, so a heart needs to pump, legs need to walk, um, stomachs need to digest, brains need to think, and by thinking about that function, we can glean into how they operate. And that's something that we can't do when we're looking at a, um, at a ball or at a, a, a metal or at, at some gas. We can't say what's the function of that. It doesn't have a function. It doesn't have a task associated with it. And once you have a function, then you can try and think about that uh, function in terms of a computation. You have some inputs, you have some outputs. And um, that's what brought me into a computer science department, trying to think about biological systems in terms of their function and, and understanding their function, and then trying to exploit that understanding in order to build better machines. Um, so let me, let me uh, get started. So um, today's talk is about one aspect of that computation which is intelligence, and in particular, artificial intelligence. I hope I can get rid of that. Okay, good. So um, let's plunge straight into it and ask, what is artificial intelligence? And the truth is that it's not one thing, it's, it's many things. But if we go back to the early start in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, um, many people would give you the following answer that artificial intelligence is about building machines that can um, compete or outcompete or mimic human-like intelligence in one or more aspects. Um, and so you wanna build human-like intelligent machines. And in particular, 
you want to um, replicate those features that we are proud of in terms of human intelligence or those sort of tasks that we find difficult with human intelligence. And so um, what are we proud of? We're proud of the rational being, right? We're proud of the fact that humans are rational. We have common sense. We make rational decisions, um, optimal decisions. Um, and sometimes we find those decisions very difficult when the um, systems that we're dealing with or when the uh, amount of information that we need to handle um, is very, very large um, or when the decision about which, dis which, which option is better in some way is not, is not easy to deduce. And so if we could build human-like intelligent machines with common sense and decision makings that naively belies deductive knowledge, we will have had an amazing AI. And because we're very human-centric, we want to use these machines to improve our understanding of human intelligence. Um, so we want to use our understanding of human intelligence to build those machines, though not all of AI uses insight from humans. Um, and we want to hopefully use AI to improve our understanding of cognition, of human intelligence, of human problem solving, and so on. And, um, and so what is the holy grail of that view of artificial intelligence? Um, it's obviously chess, right? The pinnacle of difficulty um, was perceived in the 1950s and 60s. If a computer could solve chess, then we would have a real artificial intelligence, right? Um, in that case, we've cracked AI in the 1980s. So for those of you who didn't know, the first machine that could beat, that could beat a, a uh, grandmaster in chess uh, was designed by DeepMind. Uh, in in uh, was called DeepMind, and it was it was using uh, this uh, brand of artificial intelligence, which I'll get to in a few minutes, called uh, machine learning, um, and uh, it used a huge amount of computational power, and it basically crunched through um, all possible chess moves and saw which chess move was most likely to win the game and, uh, and did that. And the interesting thing is, the interesting anecdote is that even though this was a really complicated piece of computer software um, that used huge amounts of uh, computational power at the time, there were these two mediocre chess players, they were nowhere near grandmasters, but they understood enough about chess and they understood enough about computers because they were computer scientists. And they actually went through that software and tried to understand, try to make that, uh, try to explain to themselves what is the logic or the common sense behind that, uh, behind that software. And using their insights from that, they designed a much simpler program that also beat the, the, these grandmasters at chess. And now these programs could beat both the computer and the grandmaster and, and the chess race, the computer chess race started. So now you have these very compact machines that you start off by building these computer, computer intelligence with, and then you actually use the human intelligence to interpret, simplify, consolidate, and, and, and you run with it. And that iteration has been driving um, artificial intelligence over decades. This is just one example. Um, okay, so how does this uh, um, artificial intelligence work? So uh, I'll describe a few different um, streams, two in particular. Um, the first one called symbolic AI, um, also known as good old fashioned AI which has this funny acronym. Um, and good old fashioned AI um, is based on the notion that um, if you want to um, have true intelligence, it needs to be generalizable. It needs to be able to solve any problem and therefore it needs its own language. 
And, um, and so what do we use for language? We use symbols. And so this is symbolic AI, which uh, one definition is um, as follows. You would say that a physical symbol system that exercises its intelligence in problem solving uh, by search um, is a symbolic uh, artificial intelligence system. Um, and uh, what is that? So you're generating all kinds of structures on the computer, all kinds of patterns, all kinds of hypotheses, and you keep modifying them and iterating them until you get the best solution. And how do you um, manipulate these symbols? Well, you manipulate them by having rules in place to say, for example, uh, if I'm adding two numbers, then I add the digits and uh, the, the uh, digits, and then I, I uh, uh, move over the digits columns. Any anything bigger than uh, nine, I move over to the tens column, and then I sum those. These are rules that we use to do math. In the same way, we have rules for grammar, for language. In the same way, we have rules for many many other aspects of decision making and logic and pattern finding. And therefore, we can put in place these rules that guide the search, and uh, and we can produce these really intelligent solutions. So this is symbolic AI. There are some um, really important keywords here that I've highlighted in red. Um, the first one is search. So it's this is perhaps the most important word that a first year computer science student or a GCSE computer science student or, or an A-level computer science student should know. So a huge amount of computer science, not just artificial intelligence, comes down to search. We write programs to search, right? So when we're trying to solve a problem, if we can translate that problem into a search problem, then we, can, then we know where we are. And there are so many different search algorithms for different types of contexts. And so we're basically saying, can we convert um, the question of intelligence, of problem solving that requires intelligence into all kinds of search problems that, but where those search problems are represented symbolically so that we can apply rules to solving them. And what do you need in order to do that? Well, one thing that you need if, if, uh, if you're going to use symbols is you need a representation. You need to model your data using some language and you need to make assumptions about what the representation of the data is. For example, if I have some uh, um, images, I can represent them as an image or I can try and uh, represent them as a table of pixel values or I can represent them as a table of edges. Where are the edges in that image? and so on and so forth. So the question is, how do I represent the data? And this is true for language. This is true for, for anything else. And the other thing is that um, I need the rules. I need the, the, um, the, the uh, mechanisms by which I actually optimize my algorithm. And those rely on heuristics. And heuristics is, is, um, has its technical definition. Think about it as rules of, of thumb or, or seat of the pants. Uh, uh, methods, right? So as the problems get increasingly difficult, we can't exhaustively search through every possible scenario. And so we need heuristics to tell us where is smart to, to search and where is not smart, to, to direct our attention, uh, to direct the computer's intelligence into the right types of, of areas. Okay, so that's symbolic AI. Um, and the converse is called machine learning. That's in a sense, the new kid on the block. So symbolic AI is was the prevalent form of AI in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and it's still quite popular today and, and is making a lot of uh, strides today. But in the 1970s, late 70s and early 80s, uh, machine learning came into existence. That's a completely new paradigm of artificial intelligence. And, um, and since 2005, this has um, sort of taken over the world. And this is when the general public started hearing about artificial intelligence. And so, um, so this is completely different. It's about the use and development of computer systems um, to learn and adapt without following these rules 
right? So not using knowledge about the world, but figuring it all out using statistical models to analyze and draw inferences from patterns in data. And so you basically show the computer data and it creates a model of that data by trying to find patterns in the data. And then you show it more data and then you show it more data and you show it more data and gradually it learns what you want it to learn. Um, so whereas good old fashioned AI or symbolic AI is based on rules and knowledge and common sense and language, machine learning is all about data. It's all data driven. Both are good old fashioned AI, both symbolic AI and um, machine learning require some learning very often. But in one case, the learning is uh, um, using information that's that, that's put into the system with a human using knowledge and rules and language. And in the other case, you're mostly just learning from the data. And so there are two basic views of learning. One of them is that you're creating these models of the data and your ultimate aim is general intelligence. And um, one of the aspects about these rules is that almost in all cases of, of good old fashioned AI, there are some exceptions, those rules are deterministic. In other words, um, if you run the same algorithm twice on the same data, you will get the same answer. And um, the converse machine learning approach identifies patterns in the data using uh, usually aimed at very specific tasks. So it's not necessarily aimed at general intelligence. Um, and the models that are being generated are not deterministic. In other words, they're not reproducible. They are instead statistical probabilistic models. So every time you run them, they do something different. Every time you learn, even from the same data, you will learn differently. Okay. Um, so how far can we get with either one of those approaches? So the truth is that if you, even have a very, very small number of rules, sometimes that can get you a very long way. And the very first examples of that um, are chat boxes. So the very first chat box um, is, was developed in 1966 by Joseph Weizenbaum. And um, all it did was find patterns of words and, and substitute them in context. And there were rules about the context and about the grammar. And, it, it did amazingly well. It, the, 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 there's a funny anecdote about, about Weizenbaum's secretary who uh, loved this chat box so much. It was such amazing. It, it provided such an amazing companion to her that instead of doing her work, she would sit there chatting with the chat box with Eliza uh, all day long and, and, and hide that away from, from uh, Weizenbaum. Um, Okay, and, and, but rule-based systems have gone a long way from there. Um, and today you find them in the back end of, of lots and lots of systems. You find them at the back end of the NHS when you call 199 and somebody asks you questions. Well, there's a rule-based system telling that person um, what to ask you in the emergency services. And that's not just true for the emergency services. Sometimes it's true for, um, it, it's true for, for lots and lots of the software that's being run in the NHS. But also almost all the uh, uh, software that, that legal services use now has some element of looking up cases and, and, and using rules in order to say, um, you know, you should do this, you should do that, you have this chance of winning with this argument and so on. Case law, tax law, uh, um, you name it. And, and, and um, so, so these, these rule-based systems have done very well. Um, there are a lot of things that they haven't been able to solve, though. For example, um, we haven't been able to to uh, um, to play chess with them. That's an example. Um, so, just as as another fun example of of a chat box, here's another one. It's called Shridlu, and that one is. Um, um, has a language which uh, which is slightly different than this pattern matching, and and is supposed to use these rules uh, uh, that, that use common sense. And so um, so basically, the idea is that you have a simulation of these blocks, and you give instructions to the computer to do stuff with these blocks. So the person might say, 
pick up a red block and the computer says, okay, and does it on the computer. And then the person says, grasp the pyramid. And the computer says, I don't understand which pyramid you mean. And the person says, find the block which is taller than the one you are holding and put it into the box. And then the computer says, by it, I assume you mean the block which is taller than the one I am holding. And the computer says, okay, and does it, and so on and so forth. So you can see, you can see that you don't need many rules if you invent your language and the world of that language, in this case, blocks, you can get quite, quite a long way. You know what are the keywords, you know that there's color, size, and so on. Oops, um, I didn't mean that, sorry. Uh, let me, uh, let, whoops, no, I'm in the, I'm in the wrong slide altogether. So let me try and go back to, to something meaningful. So we were here. Sorry about that. Okay. And um, okay. So uh, what about machine learning? So machine learning uh, really took off. Uh, so it started in the 1970s. Um, but what's really taken off are these things called neural networks or deep neural networks. Um, which um, in, in 2005 algorithms were published that allow for um, much more efficient learning using these neural networks. And I'll explain a little bit what that, what that means, but before I do that, um, this has completely revolutionized uh, uh, what we can do with artificial intelligence. And it started with very, very specific tasks such as face recognition. And today it's, um, it's beating a lot of rule-based systems in how it deals with um, even more general tasks. So you've got being released in some countries, um, self-driving cars, and you've got um, Google's DeepMind, um, which is uh, started off not just cracking chess, but then cracking a different game called Go, which is much, much harder to play. Um, and, and, and then in the search of seeking uh, more general intelligence, they came up with this machine called, with this, with this uh, um, system called AlphaZero, which plays different games. So it plays three different games here. Um, and what's amazing about this AlphaZero is, um, that it doesn't learn from humans. So the previous models of all of these game playing things were that you, you, you played them against the human enough times until they picked up the patterns and they knew how to play it. But these machines basically play against other machines and then they play against other machines and they play against themselves and they learn everything just by learning from other machines or from, from, from their own experience. And they come up with strategies that humans would never have been able to uh, come up with. And that's amazing because they can really crack these uh, very, very difficult problems. On the other hand, um, because these are based on these huge neural networks rather than rule-based systems, um, and um, because they're data-driven uh, rather than rule-based driven, they have one ma massive challenge, which is explainability. So you can't just go into the system and say, oh, so this is how this happened. I can understand the logic. I can say that this logic makes sense to me or that this is a new principle. Maybe I should learn it or maybe I should argue against it because it won't generalize well and so on and so forth. And so you can't tweak the logic of the system because you can't get into the system. And basically what all of these neural networks are based on, as I said, is, is um, this notion of a neuron, but this is an artificial neuron. So it takes the concept of um, a biological neuron, so a brain cell of any animal, and it simplifies the brain cell into a very, very simple equation, which says that inputs come in, and if the inputs are big enough, then the neuron fires. And um, 
that is at the heart of all of these neural networks. Um, that and the mechanism for then saying, okay, so what are the parameters or what are the things I need to tweak about that neuron and about the connections between those neurons to give me the, um, to give me the outputs that I want given some problem. And that's where the learning takes place. And that's where, where uh, um, all of the progress has been in the last 15 years or so in, in these deep neural networks or much of the progress. Okay, so um, both of these approaches, whether you're playing Go with machine learning um, or whether you're playing uh, um, Go with a, chess, with a rule based system, um, can be um, most of the applications, nearly all of the applications. Um, everything running at the back end of the internet, everything running in a lawyer's office or in a GP's office um, is something that I would call, and other people have called, disembodied AI. So uh, disembodied AI, you, you don't need a physical body for the computer. It's not acting in the real world. It doesn't need a keyboard and a mouse. It just needs um, a chip, an internet, ch a, a computer chip to run its processes on. It can be anywhere in the world. It doesn't matter. It doesn't need a physical body, okay? Um, and this goes back to the 1940s and this dream of replicating human intelligence, which is ultimately uh, creative uh, um, and logical and abstract, right? So we're not very proud of being able to, uh, to sleep and wake up and walk, but we're very proud of, of playing chess. This is a disembodied task. Um, and if you take that notion of human intelligence, well, you can take it quite far. And, and Alan Turing already in the 40s took it quite far. He was talking, um, he was realizing that, that um, if you really had good general intelligence, um, you could uh, play abstract games, for example. So um, if you, if you um, design a game well, you don't need contact with the outside world. He also realized that um, you, could, um, you could translate these problems to search problems. So for example, you could imagine a computer chess player already in the 1940s, and you can imagine devising search algorithms that are used in order to find good moves that are rule-based. That makes sense. Okay. Or machine learning just by searching in an exhaustive way or, or a statistical way. And he could also um, imagine what seemed then a much more challenging task of uh, deciding whether a computer was intelligent. So this is known as the Turing test. Um, and the idea is that you have a person um, with a keyboard uh, in one room or behind the screen and a computer um, behind the, the screen or in the other room. And they send each other messages um, and the uh, human needs to know whether the um, behind the screen is a human or a computer. And so you can, you can change it. You can have sometimes the, computer, the human speaks to a human, sometimes the human speaks to a computer. Can the human tell whether the uh, uh, conversation it's having is with a chat box or with a human? Um, and, and I'll leave it to you to, to um, ask you whether you think that that problem has been solved or not. But um, certainly chess has been solved and, um, and computers can do quite powerful things. And so um, I'll leave it there. So, so um, this, all of these notions of, of disembodied AI um, are based on, on attempts to simulate reasoning. And what is reasoning? It's abstract, it's formal, it's disembodied. And in the eyes of the computer scientists, it's all about symbol manipulation. And it's almost always deterministic. In the early days, today, machine learning with its statistical methods is trying to, um, to, to crack some of the same problems. Did I do that again? Um, and um, so, so that's, that's the, this view of disembodied AI. I want to move on to another brand of AI, but before that, 
um, I might take a short break by just giving you a glimpse of some of the things that have been done in the last 20 years or so in the School of Computing at Leeds. None of this is my work, uh, but um, it's all quite exciting. It's all AI. Some of it is rule-based. Some of it is machine learning based. Um, so here is uh, an example. So this is uh, people counting at the entrances and exits of shops and then basic uh, artificial intelligence in order to decide whether um, more people need to be added, more cashier tills need to be opened or whether some of them can be closed. And this is a system that's being used um, in, in Tesco and in Morrison's in American shops all over the world. Um, and, and some of the basic uh, uh, um, intelligence that's required here is when things are moving through the door, you need to count who are the actual people. You don't want to count uh, um, objects. You don't want to count animals. You just want to count the people. And if groups of people are coming in and they're together, you don't want to count them as, a as, as individuals. You want to count them as a group. And so, uh, so that's where the, the computer uh, intelligence or the machine intelligence um, or the artificial intelligence comes in here. Um, examples of rule-based systems are um, constructing ontologies or word systems and the associated knowledge bases that then drive the rules in order to, um, to create databases that are useful for people. So for example, um, if you look at the uh, uh, cities that we live in, what you see is what's overground. But what's underground is vast and huge, but not visible. We don't have good maps of what's underground. Uh, we don't know um, where different pipes are and where different utilities are. It's a vast underground city uh, which is absolutely essential for our survival. Uh, but assessing it and mapping it um, is really, really difficult. And so uh, work in the School of Computing has uh, created uh, uh, the, the, the uh, artificial intelligence systems to be able to uh, uh, map and assess underground utilities. Um, and is that, that system is being used in, uh, in Scotland and is now entering use in, in uh, England um, for almost all utilities, to my knowledge. One lot, lots and lots of prizes. Um, here's another example. Um, so uh, so these, these systems uh, are, are basically knowledge systems. Um, so here's another example is using natural language processing. In other words, computers that understand language in order to uh, translate and interpret and parse the Quran um, and, other, and other religious texts from, from uh, Islam. Um, and another example is uh, from the TV show Friends. Uh, this is combining computer vision and um, natural language processing to um, see who is saying what in the show. Okay, so you hear the sound, then you need to say who's saying what. Um, and, and you make their faces move accordingly based on the uh, sounds. Um, and another example here, this is uh, using a robot called Lucy that is basically navigating um, what is now the old computer science department because we've moved buildings since um, and learning uh, the map of the building as it's moving about. So constructing a map of uh, where it's going about. And this is, um, uh, so the furniture might be moving about from one day to the next. Uh, people might be going in and out and it needs, to, it needs to be able to distinguish between those items that are moving and those items that are fixed like the walls. Um, and, and that sort of a system was developed in order to, to, to one day be deployed in, uh, in um, um, care in care facilities. And there's another one. So this is very much embodied AI. This is an example of manipulation robotics. So the robot here has to reach certain objects. For example, it, you might ask it to, to pick up this uh, uh, large water bottle at the back or this little one here or to get to the apple. Uh, but it needs to do that in a cluttered environment. Um, and it needs to figure out what manipulations of the objects 
it can use and how to manipulate itself in order to reach the object without breaking anything, without anything falling off the table and so on. Um, and that's part of planning um, and manipulation, which is also very much rule-based um, AI. And uh, so, so these are just, just a handful of, of uh, examples. There are many, many more. Uh, this I think is the latest that, that um, result is from, from 2019, but a lot of these projects are still ongoing. Um, okay, so that was one view of AI. Let's let's uh, let's take a deep breath and and think about AI in a completely different way. So, what if AI wasn't so disembodied? What if agents, artificial machines, um, were associated with a real body, with sensors, uh, eyes, uh, tactile sensing, smell, whatever it is, um, hearing, and they could act and think and behave in the real world environment. So there would be this feedback between the real world and the agent. Would that require different types of algorithms than we're using now? Would it lead to uh, more powerful solutions? Could that lead to more general AI or would it be more task specific? What, what, what are we going to do with that? Is it powerful? Is it useful? Um, and in particular, once you are in a body and you're interacting with the real world, then AI becomes more than just thinking, right? So then you need to think about what is the intelligence that I need in order to get a robot to play football? That's a completely different kind of intelligence and one that um, has been occupying computer scientists and artificial intelligence researchers for decades and still robots playing uh, um, football are, are pretty lousy. And so you could say that to a certain extent, this is because of the hardware, the limitations of the, of the robotic hardware, but actually a lot of it is because of the limitations of the artificial intelligence as well. And, um, and the hardware is catching up with us. And so what about the intelligence? So um, if we wanna take that viewpoint seriously, then let's take a step back and rethink about traditional computing AI included, and recognize that it's task oriented. It's about a chat box or about playing chess or about face recognition. Um, so that's going to be, um, let's consider vertical tasks, but rather than um, chess, let's consider a whole bunch of them. Um, and now let's consider different um, agents, biological agents, not artificial agents that can perform these tasks. So um, turns out that nearly all animals perform lots and lots of tasks. So worms don't walk, but they still move. Crickets, iguanas, and humans all walk, um, all have sex, all have memory. Um, do they all play chess? Uh, uh oh. Um, actually, that's the human one, right? So. That's the reason AI focused on the humans because only humans play chess. But actually, if we really want to understand intelligence, should we not look at those tasks that are done by lots and lots of animals? Um, because to survive, animals need to be good across the board. They can't just play chess or just do one task or just do another task. The whole point about brains is that they allow animals to do everything they need to do within their ecological niche. So let's think about these um, vertical and, and horizontal tasks. Um, and um, so this goes back to the 1980s to a chap at MIT called Rodney Brooks, who was a, a critic of, of the human-centered AI approach. And, and he was making this argument, he wrote a paper saying, why not the whole iguana? And he was saying, 
rather than build parts of human intelligence, why can't we build an entire intelligence? We can't build an entire human intelligence. That's too hard for us, at least at the moment. But can we build an entire much simpler intelligence? And isn't that going to uh, progress AI in, in, in many uh, uh, ways that, that uh, we couldn't have uh, envisioned with just rule-based AI? So if we're going to take that approach seriously, then I would say, let's not go to iguanas. Let's start really simple. Um, so um, you've got the disembodied human who can think, um, at least on the computer. Um, what can worms do? They certainly can't play chess, uh, but they can do a lot of things. So here is where um, my group um, comes into the picture. This is us in front of the old computer science building and me with short hair, which means it was before coronavirus. Um, and um, and here's, here's uh, uh, the worm that we're dealing with. So the worm that we're dealing with is called C. elegans. It's a round worm. So uh, um, also called a nematode. Um, and it's microscopic and transparent and lives for just a few days and has precisely 302 brain cells. So whereas humans have of the order of 100 billion, 302 is a number that each and every one of you and even little children can count to. And so that maybe is a tractable problem, something that we can actually solve. Um, so it can't play chess, uh, but it can um, smell and it can touch and it can eat and it can sleep and it navigates complex terrains and it forages for preferred foods and it has satiety behaviors. It escapes predators, it mates, it exhibits learning and memory and even basic social behaviors. So can we, can we build that intelligence? And will that be helpful to us? Um, so we built models of the locomotion of the animal. And this is a model of the locomotion of the animal that actually doesn't have any vision or, or other sensory capabilities and is still just by virtue of reflexes, but based on what the worm actually has, uh, is able to navigate obstacles. Um, and here you've got a, um, a robot. Whoops, I thought that I uh, disabled the sound for that. Oh, oh well. So this, I'll, I'll, I'll skip through it because I, I um, totally hate the sound. Um, forgive me, everybody. Uh, but it navigates obstacles. And it basically what this robot is, is um, the, the computer program that runs the, that runs the, the uh, robot is the model of the biological animal that's just been put into this robot. Even though this worm is, is a millimeter long and this robot is, is of the order of a meter long, the physics is completely different and so on. We basically just took the software from one system to the other, put it in and, um, and, and amazing, it, it just works and, it, and actually it does navigate um, all of these obstacles. Um, and there's another example. So this is um, how the worm um, navigates in three dimensions now. So this is how scientists typically study the worm, which is on a dish, on a Petri dish in the lab, whereas in the wild, um, the animal lives in compost and in soil and rotting vegetation. Um, and this is a snippet of our um, computer vision AI driven reconstruction of the shape of the worm as it's moving through three dimensional um, gels in our lab. And I'll, I'll get back to that um, in a minute. Um, so this is uh, to show you that the, the organism's uh, neural again, circuit is made up of Okay, here is how to get rid of the sound. So this is the this is the reconstruction of this entire nervous system of this animal, which was achieved in in uh, the 1980s and digitized later. And so this map of 302 um, brain cells of this animal has been constructed. So it's not just that you have 302 brain cells as compared to 100, 100 million, uh, but but. Um, 100 billion, sorry, uh, but rather that, that um, you even know how those brain cells are wired together. You have the wiring diagram. All you need to figure out is 
what is the algorithm? What is the uh, what are the rules that drive the system to generate these different behaviors? And I'll give you a few more examples. So here is now the actual experimental setup in our lab, which is used to record these three-dimensional behaviors. So we put the worms in very large cubes and we image them from three different directions. And there's the challenge for the computer vision is now given these video streams of synchronized images from three different directions, can you figure out what is the shape of the animal? So you need to recognize a little transparent object in, the, in, in, in a large field of view uh, from three different directions. You need to recognize that the three objects correspond to each other in the three views, and you need to be able to do some sort of a, a complicated uh, um, model-driven and data-driven learning process in order to figure out the shapes that this animal takes. And so these white shapes that you're seeing in the movie here, these are our AI driven uh, reconstructions from um, the actual video streams. Okay, and uh, let me show you even a slightly longer movie. So those short movies are snippets of this long movie which um, is a 13 minute long movie showing how the little red blotch here, which is the, the worm, is navigating this three dimensional space. And now we've reconstructed continuously in time um, the uh, posture as well as the trajectory of the animal as it's moving through space. Okay, so this stage of the work um, and, and that's quite interesting because you can ask, okay, how do worms perform search, right? How do worms explore space? How do they know where to go? How do they decide whether to go locally or to run away? And you can see this characteristic uh, behavior of sort of going in runs and then doing a tumble or a turn and then going in a new direction and then going in a new direction and in a new direction and in a new direction. And this, this teaches us about how uh, worms are able to uh, uh, explore their space while they're foraging for food, for example, or doing other things or seeking better conditions and so on. Okay, so, um, so just to, to um, highlight some of these problems which are really at the very cutting edge of artificial intelligence, the first problem that I've explained here is computer vision and is focused on the task of shape reconstruction the second one is um, learning uh, these shapes and their dynamics from data. So can I understand what sort of shapes the worm does go into and what sort of shapes it doesn't go into? And then the really difficult challenge for artificial intelligence is what's known as inverse model, which is saying, given that I have the postures and the trajectories of the animal, how does the animal do that? Can I, for example, tell you which muscle is twitching? So out of all of the muscles that the animal has, and I can tell you it has 95 muscles, which, mus which muscle is contracting when and by how much in order to generate this sequence of shapes that I'm seeing? Right. So for example, I could ask you, how is your tongue moving in order to generate the words that, that you're speaking or my tongue moving as I'm speaking to you right now? That's a really hard problem. And so these are the uh, problems that we're solving right now. Um, we're making good progress on, on, on all of them, um, but I want to, to move on to, to um, other examples of, of what we're doing with, with uh, worms. And so um, the, other, the other question that you could ask, which is perhaps more akin to the traditional artificial intelligence questions, are to do with decision-making. Okay, so here's just one example of that. Um, so um, so this is within a context of a, um, of a um, grand challenge project that Leeds took the lead in, that the University of Leeds took the lead in and has just, just finished. And, and the grand challenge that the government um, or, or the funding body of the government called EPSSC defined is what can we do to, um, to automate our cities? What can we do to make smart cities? 
And the way the, the take that we took at the University of Leeds is what can we do in order to have self-repairing cities, to have our cities smart enough so the damage can be uh, repaired much more similarly to how the damage is repaired in our cells and in our bodies as we go along. We don't wait for something to break massively, but we're constantly fixing little problems uh, and healing ourselves. And can we actually use artificial intelligence and robotics to reduce street works? And so this was sort of the, the uh, ultimate vision. And one of these uh, examples that we uh, looked at was street works. Right, so potholes um, are are uh, a real plague on on the economy in terms of um, uh, the money it costs to repair them, in terms of the damage that these potholes and 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 uh, sinkholes and cracks are causing, um, and in terms of danger to to human life. And so we said, okay, what can we do about this? And, uh, and the approach that we took in my lab together with uh, postdoc John Loans and colleague uh, Tony Cohn uh, was to think about the spirit of uh, um, self-repair. So you need swarms of tiny little miniature robots that are gonna detect cracks before they become potholes and then fix them. And so, um, so here is the, uh, did I, aha, there is a movie if it wants to show. Let's see if it shows. Have I got time for this? I'll try and... Turn off the sound for this one as well. If it lets me. So I'm sorry, it doesn't seem to be responding very nicely. But you've got this little robot, which is basically um, in this part of town, and it's detecting these tiny little cracks by whizzing about. This is sped up, I think, 10 times. And every time you see a yellow um, area here, it's found a crack there and we've covered it so it doesn't look for it again, uh, because this is an early prototype that still didn't have the repair mechanisms in it. Uh, and, and, and the way that it's um, doing it is, um, is very much a biological way. And so in this case, it found all of these little cracks. Um, and in fact, um, you can uh, run it overnight um, over Woodhouse Lane, a whole kilometer or several kilometers of Woodhouse Lane in one night uh, we did, I think, five robots over there, and, and uh, overall, we've tested it on more than 300 kilometers of Leeds roads, um, and so far, it has uh, beat every benchmark of, of, uh, uh, that we've tested it against. Um, this is an example of how we've run it all around um, the university and used it to classify different road sections as green, in other words, good condition, uh, yellow or amber as um, some defects and, and these areas uh, which have lots and lots of cracks and, and, and require urgent attention. Uh, and this is a pseudo robot where we've uh, just done a, a simple repair mechanism and, and it was able to follow the cracks and deposit material into the cracks um, as it was going along. Though the material that it was depositing wasn't the right material for fixing the uh, cracks yet. Okay, so, um, It didn't, how come I didn't show you where this is from? Ah, um, so yeah, so one slide must have disappeared. Let me, let me take you to this one. Um, so what is that crack finding robot? How is it working? Um, well, you won't be surprised given that I'm the one giving this talk that once again, it's basically a model of this little critter, C. elegans, uh, which we just took and put as is into a robot. And the particular model that we used was a model that shows us how worms forage for uh, food using cues that are not food. So what worms do is they, um, is they sense various smells in the environment. And those smells might not be the smell of food, but they might smell 
something that smells a bit like butter or something that smells a bit like salt or something that smells a bit like metal. Um, and then they either follow these cues or avoid them, depending on whether these are good or bad cues for them. And um, in some cases, those cues are adaptively being associated with good cues or bad cues. So for example, when the worm is seeking salt, it starts off by really liking the salt. And then after a few minutes, it avoids the salt. And, um, and so we found a way to actually understand what is the mechanism by which the worms are doing that. And then we realized that actually what the worms are doing is using the association between salt and a predicted presence of food. So they seek the salt because they think it's gonna lead them to food. But if they don't find the food, then they avoid the salt. And then when they get off the salt, then they say, oh, well, maybe I should go look for some salt. And then they find some other patch of salt. And this allows them to explore the environment very effectively. And it's basically that mechanism which we took and uh, implanted directly into these little robots, um, replacing the salt with road features. Um, and using images from Google Maps, from Google Street View, um, and, um, and, and, and the robot just finds the cracks. So solving a problem which is not general intelligence, um, is not reproducible, is not rational, uh, but is explainable because we built the model and is helping uh, real world engineering solutions. So let me just wrap up by, by um, mentioning from my perspective, what is the cutting edge and what are some of the uh, uh, challenges and opportunities? Um, and what are the questions associated with them? And so um, the, the, um, the one big thing at the moment, uh, which I think is, is uh, very promising in many, many ways, and you're seeing it in NHS and legal areas, and you're seeing it in other uh, uh, systems as well, is augmented intelligence. So using AI to aid the human in decision-making using the AI to suggest things or to say, look, you might look there, uh, but then letting the human have the ultimate say. Um, what you'll hear a lot more about next time by Gabriella is about fair and ethical AI. I think that, that um, from my perspective, and we can talk about this more in the question session, what is absolutely obvious is that um, making fair AI and ethical AI is difficult. The difficulties stem, first of all, from objective difficulties. So it's not as easy to solve um, the same problem for different categories of data. Um, secondly, from uh, um, the data we give the algorithms. And thirdly, because a lot of the AI is uh, basically adopting the bias of the programmers or of the systems that, that, uh, that are being programmed. Um, and, and distinguishing between these cases may, may help, but, um, but ultimately when you're talking about uh, the kinds of machines that learn from themselves, and especially if they're disembodied and not interacting with humans, I think it's probably safe to say that we can't expect those systems to be moral in a human sense. And if they ever do gain any sort of morality, I think from our standards, it's likely to be a pathological one. So uh, um, I think certainly an area to watch. Um, we've not cracked general AI. We've not cracked human AI, not by a long shot, um, but we are, but we are making uh, amazing uh, advances in general AI. And I think there's gonna be amazing progress over the next years and decades. Um, and the one biggie which um, um, is, is I think uh, a challenge that, that, that um, a lot of the AI community is focused on is how do we make something which is as powerful as the current AI um, developments and, and systems, but is explainable so that we can go in there and tweak it and, and understand it and explain it and argue with it and so on. Um, and, and the final take home that I would like to leave with is if you take all of these 
challenges or opportunities, um, it's not clear that it's obvious that there is an obvious answer to whether all of them are compatible or whether there's an incompatibility among them. And if they are incompatible, then there are going to be some choices that people have to make as to where to invest their efforts. Um, hopefully, uh, informed with a healthy discussion. Okay, so with that, I'm sorry that I took a long time, but thanks very much. Should I shop, stop sharing? Hello? Uh, yes, you could stop sharing now, Netta. Sorry, I didn't realize that I had to once again invite Eric to be unmuted, but I hope uh, he'll be able to proceed now. <laughs> Netta, thank you. Thank you for a great talk. Um, there, there were just so many things in there uh, that uh, I'm sure we have a lot of questions about that. Now, um, once we once we stop sharing, uh, right? So I need to stop sharing. There we go. Great. Thank you. So uh, people can uh, put their hand up or speak their question, or they can uh, they can write uh, write a question in the chat. Um, and uh, somebody has has written a question. Uh, Christine has written a question about uh, taking your system to detect potholes. Uh, are you going to develop a, a system to to repair them? I guess we had some sort of indication of that from one of one of your slides, but 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 but, but you know where, where does where does your work stop and, and and other work, you know, carry on? I guess. Right. So 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 um, so the repair is pretty much where my work has to um, almost stop. So basically, what I can do is I can um, come up with. Uh, ideas or with systems, they might be from biology or they might just be informed by my understanding of lots of different biological systems and I can, I can sort of create hybrids of them, or I can use more conventional AI approaches and, um, and build what's known as the control algorithms for these robots. Okay, so I can decide how the robot moves and I can decide what sort of sensors to put onto the robot that will interact best with this control algorithm and so on. Um, why that doesn't give you repair is because for repair you also need excellent material engineering. Mm. So the material engineering, you need the right material that will uh, go into the road, that will do it uh, relatively quickly, so we'll dry very, very relatively quickly, that will mer merge with the road and survive despite cars driving over it, despite changes of weather, despite rain and snow and ice and all the rest of it. And that's the challenge for the material engineers. But we do work with the material engineers and, um, and, and we're hoping that, that, um, that we can make progress. Um, Right, right. I mean, I, one, I had a couple, couple of thoughts. I mean, I'm, I'm a uh, biological scientist, and uh, uh, I just wondered, um, you know, did or is AI having any in, impact on coronavirus and the pandemic? Um, can we use that to predict um, anything about um, the future course of infections? Uh, I mean, they're massive systems, I guess, to uh, to uh, to study its populations, um, and I, I, I don't know um, where, where, where uh, you know where that is going. Right, you've just suggested um, last year's uh, final year projects. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, so I, I supervised a number of those, uh, both at final year and master's level, and I'm supervising them again this year. 
um, and um, and basically what we're doing um, is is very very simple, uh, much simpler than what than what Sage are doing, um, and I think that that is giving us insight into what is the power of the modeling and what are the limitations of the modeling, mm -hmm. uh, rather than doing these really really elaborate models. So the basic uh, epidemic models are based on um, interactions between agents that are called susceptibles, infected, removed. Um, and sometimes you can add other, other populations called exposed and so on, or recovered or immune, right? So you can, you can define right, different states of population. If infected person uh, meets a susceptible person, then there's a certain probability that the susceptible person gets uh, infected and so you can ask in a population, given some rules of mixing um, with spatial constraints, without spatial constraints, what is the probability of exposure? What is the probability of infection given exposure? What is the incubation period? What then is the uh, uh, duration while the new person is infectious? And are they then turning back to susceptibles or are they immune? Are they, are they dead? And, and you can run these simulations. Mm -hmm. The problem is that the, the parameters of those simulations, those probabilities, those rates that I was describing, those depend on the conditions. They one depend on the, on the strain of the virus. So clearly it's not the same for alpha and for delta, for example. But secondly, they depend on whether there's a lockdown or not. They depend on the restrictions. Yeah. And thirdly, they depend on what percentage of the population and which age groups of the populations and the susceptibility of those age groups and so on are, are vaccinated and whether those vaccines are effective. Yeah. And so what you have is effectively, <clears throat> you, can, you can take all of these changing factors, all of these dynamic factors and say, they give you those rates that you're talking about. And yeah. so you can use machine learning or other methods of AI, but principally machine learning, principally these deep neural networks to learn what are the values of the parameters over time. Using training data, because by now we have a lot of training data and you can show, first of all, how those parameters are changing over time but secondly, you can show that if you know the parameters well, you can predict well. But once the restrictions change and therefore the parameters change, or once the virus changes, that's when it falls apart. And then you need to adapt the parameters. Mm -hmm. Now, what I can't predict for you is how the parameters will change. Yeah. That would be a meta learning. Yeah. <laughs> and for that, I would need to know a lot more about the, the biology of the virus um, and the DNA of the virus and which mutations are likely to be to, to survive selective pressure and which not. And, and I don't think anybody knows that. No. And we, we, we've got a question from Ewan. Um, uh, <clears throat> thanks for the great talk. Um, I was wondering if there's much interest as, or scope in applying genetic algorithms alongside more behavior based learning to improve performance. Some yep. specialized terms in there, I think. Yep, yep, great question. And yes, there's huge scope for applying genetic algorithms. And this is a, a bread and butter tool that we all use. I use it as well. Uh, I have to, I have to uh, perhaps caveat uh, the, the different ways of uh, uh, running different optimization approaches, whether they're machine learning, whether they're, they're rule-based, whether they're uh, uh, just conventional optimization methods. Um, and this is getting a bit technical, so I apologize to some of you who, who, who perhaps it, it, it's, it's late in the evening, but when you're, when you're um, fitting or optimizing something, you need to define an error function. Okay, so you need to say, this is the error that I'm trying to minimize, or you need to uh, define an objective function. And for genetic algorithms, we define fitness functions. Okay, so we say, um, having these traits, I can put those traits into my model, I can run a simulation of the model, and I'm looking for the fastest worm, and that's my objective. 
And people have done that and generated models of this worm C elegance using objective functions, for example, maximizing speed. And I would say this is absolutely great and it's exciting. Um, and you can use it for robotics, for example, and for artificial intelligence, but don't tell me that, um, that it models the worm because worms don't maximize speed. They maximize a whole bunch of things and probably speed isn't one of them. Humans and other, other animals that developed that evolved nervous systems in order to be able to react quickly to the environment may, op may optimize speed along with, with other uh, uh, selection criteria, but probably nematodes didn't. Um, and, so, and so we don't know what the fitness function of worms are. And so we need to be very, very careful when we use genetic algorithms with defining our fitness function. If there is a, um, a different approach, which is saying, well, I'll take some footage of a real worm. I'll take the footage of my simulation and I'll define an error function, which tells me how different they are. And I'll use that error function to drive my genetic algorithm. And now you're beginning to talk about understanding the biology because you're actually matching the same behavior. You don't know how it was generated, but at least you're getting a model that, after, that captures the right behavior. Um, perhaps the downside of it is that genetic algorithms have less explainable power than other approaches where you can actually use some principled approach in order to say, well, that parameter should be higher and that one should be lower. That one uh, shouldn't exist because worms don't have it and so on and so forth. Uh, but it's but it's a very powerful tool. Yes, we use genetic algorithms all the time. Now, the, the other thing that really came to my attention was a paper in, in Nature last year where they used, um, I think, neural networks to to predict um, new new antibiotics, and uh, they, they they search for patterns in molecules that. Uh, you know that, that we would never predict, and they came up with a uh, with, with, with a new drug that was uh, uh, that, that, that was active against uh, drug resistant strains of E. coli. Uh, fantastic, fantastic. That's right. And 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 the latest and the latest word for deep mind just a few months ago is that they've uh, presumably cracked protein folding. Yeah. Machine yeah. learning. Yeah. 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 So that, I mean, there is kind of nowhere that <laughs> nowhere that it's not going. Great. Um, the, the, uh, I think the questions have slowed up a little bit in the chat. Um, it, it's, uh, I guess it's 10 to 9. It's, get, it's getting, getting on a little bit. It is getting late. I'm sorry about that. Uh, no, no, no. It's, uh, that, that's, that's great. We've, uh, I, I think everybody's re really, really enjoyed this talk. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Netta, uh, for, for giving the talk and, uh, and coming to the Leeds Film and Lit. Uh, uh, for those of you who are, who are, who are uh, looking in, um, uh, you may be members. Um, if you're not members, it's very easy to become a member. Um, uh, we have a new website. Uh, just search for Leeds, Phil Phil and Le Leeds Philosophical and Literary Society on Google. You'll find us very easily. And uh, you'll be able to see our, our new website, and a very easy way uh, to join the society. Um, it's only £25. And if, if any of you are 18 to 25, it's free. Uh, so um, uh, uh, do, do take a look at that. Uh, Rachel, um, can I just uh, uh, thank you for um, arranging this talk tonight? W would you like just to come back in for a moment and tell us about the sequel to this, uh, uh, to this talk and uh, the next the next talk about ethics? Um, yes, I, I'll um, come in. I'll actually ask um, Gabriella herself if she'd like to come in here and uh, talk about it, because uh, she's going to be our next speaker. Oh, we have you in the audience. Wow. Yeah. Uh, there we are. Um, okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Good. Great. Well, nice to meet you all. Uh, great talk, Netta. I really enjoyed it. Um, Next, uh, the next session is going to be a bit different. It's not going to be um, so technical. So you now had uh, a bit of an introduction of how things work and you kind of have an idea of what to expect. And for the next session, I'm going to talk about the difficulties about um, developing 
the design of these things and how they relate to social problems. So for example, how these algorithms can end up being kind of a um, double-edged sword. It, they can be very helpful, but sometimes when we apply them in society, they, they bring a lot of problems. Uh, the same with robots, like if we have care robots, uh, sex robots, there's a lot of talk about the human robot interaction and what that implies to the future of how we behave um, morally, but also in society in general. So the next session, I'm going to introduce uh, some views that um, several academics and philosophers have talked about in terms of uh, how can we deal with these things. And uh, I know Netta was very, uh, specific saying there's a problem with explainability and that has to do with transparency as well and um, I'm going to show another version of that problem so it's not just about explainability of the algorithm or the model itself how it works I'm going to put some emphasis as well in explainability in terms of moral justification which is something I work on um, but it hasn't been done that much and I think is, is quite relevant so that's what you should probably expect. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and thank you very much, everybody, for uh, uh, for attending. Uh, great to see you all. All the best. Thank you, and uh, good night. Take care. Thanks very much, Eric. And I just add to um, everyone in the audience, please um, do tell your friends oh. about Phil and Lit Talks. Encourage them to attend, and um, encourage them to become members. Or um, if they just attend a one-off thing, we've got a donation button on our website now. So you could always just make a contribution, even if you uh, don't want to become a full member just yet. Anyway, we've got quite a few new members just since we launched the new website back in July. And we're hoping to, to build up the, the, the range of our, our members, um, include uh, people from all, all walks of life across the arts and sciences and uh, culture in Leeds and beyond. So um, you'll be extremely welcome to join us. Okay, um, uh, so uh, Gabriella's talk will be on the 11th of October and then there'll be more uh, events appearing on the new website. I'm gradually getting my act together to learn how to make the most of it. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.